Hi everybody, welcome to the next lecture. Uh, this time we'll be talking about propositional operators and how to create truth tables. And so where we left off, we essentially have been able to reconstruct arguments and get them from paragraph form into standard form. But now that they're in standard form, it's still sometimes very complicated to determine whether or not the argument's valid or invalid. And so what we need to do is take that argument from standard form and put it into symbolic form. And once we put it in symbolic form, then we're able to create a truth table that will tell us whether or not the argument is valid or invalid. Before we get to that, though, it's important that we understand the difference between a simple and complex proposition. A simple proposition is just a proposition, one of those statements where uh, you have a subject and a verb and something is occurring to where you're making an assertion about the world. So take the first sentence, for instance, Jamie went to the store. Here, this sentence cannot be broken up any more than it already is. It's making a very simple assertion about Jamie and where she went. The second proposition, however, is a bit of a complex proposition. And the reason that the second proposition is a complex proposition is because there's an element to that proposition that can be broken down into different parts. So for instance, Aaron is acting very unusual today. In order to break this proposition down, we can write it in the affirmative of Aaron is acting usual today. And essentially what we're saying is it's not the case that Aaron is acting usual today. Therefore, Aaron is acting very unusual. This will make a little bit more sense once we get to the operators. How about this one? The stars and the moon will be visible during the day. This is a complex proposition because it's a combination of two simple propositions. The stars will be visible during the day and the moon will be visible during the day. Here we use the conjunctive word and to connect the two simple propositions, the stars will be visible and the moon will be visible. Here are more complex propositions. If Trump gets his way, the United States will no longer be part of the Paris Treaty in 2020. Again, we have two simple propositions within this complex proposition. The first being that Trump gets his way. Again, we're making an assertion about the world namely that Trump gets his way, but we're also making the assertion that the U.S. will no longer be part of the Paris Peace Treaty in 2020. Here, we will need to connect these two simple propositions, and in this particular proposition, we're doing it with a conditional statement. Notice how we're saying, if Trump gets his way, comma. Essentially, we're saying, if Trump gets his way, then the U.S. will no longer be part of the Paris Peace Treaty in 2020. Going back to last lecture, we see that the U.S. Uh, no longer being part of the Paris Peace Treaty in 2020 is a necessary condition upon Trump getting his way. And Trump getting his way is sufficient for the U.S. no longer being part of the Paris Peace Treaty. The next one, the MLS is only going to award a soccer team to San Diego if and only if San Diegans pass a stadium bill. Here again, we have two simple propositions. The MLS is going to award a soccer team to San Diego. That proposition cannot be broken down any further. And also, San Diegans pass a stadium bill. Here, the complex proposition is being held together by a biconditional if and only if statement. So when we're dealing with complex propositions, it's important to note that they can be turned into symbol form using a set of propositional operators. 
And there are five propositional operators that we're going to talk about and use in this class. So any argument written in propositional logic can be broken down and symbolized with propositional operators. This does not mean that when a proposition is broken down, that it becomes an argument. You still have to deal with the argument in standard form, but now you'll just have a bullet point list of symbols and letters that make reference to the standard form argument written in sentence form. This is what we need to do in order to create a truth table to determine whether or not an argument is going to be valid or invalid. Here is a table of the propositional operators that we're going to use in this course. It's important that you memorize this table as it will be used throughout the rest of the course. So starting from the top, we see that a conditional statement is essentially an if-then statement. And an if-then statement in logic can be represented with an arrow pointing to the right. This essentially means that P, or what we will call the antecedent of the conditional statement, is sufficient for Q, the consequent of the conditional statement. Remember, P will be sufficient for Q, and Q will be necessary of P. So when we see a conditional statement written, it can be symbolized as P arrow Q. It's also important to note that moving forward, if you do your own research or outside research, you may notice that there is another symbol for a conditional, and it's a sideways horseshoe. This is the same as the arrow, and if you choose to use the sideways horseshoe when submitting work, that's perfectly acceptable. The next operator is the double-sided arrow that represents a biconditional statement. Here we're saying P if and only if Q. Remember, with biconditional statements, both P and Q are necessary and sufficient of one another. The next symbol for the disjunction is a V, and it represents OR statements. So if I'm using OR to connect two simple propositions, P or Q, I can write that P, V, Q. The next conjunction is an AND claim, and here we represent that with the AND percent symbol. You might also see this represented with a dot, like a multiplication symbol. Lastly, the negation, not P, we represent not with a tilde, it's just the squiggly line before the P. Notice here how we're using P's and Q's. And these are just variables that we're going to be using to represent a simple proposition. It doesn't matter if you use P or Q or A or B or X or Y. And you'll even see later in this lecture that I'll use symbols like an airplane or a skull and crossbones. These are just variable placeholders for simple propositions. And when those simple propositions need to be connected with another simple proposition, we use one of these five operators. So let's try and symbolize this proposition. If it rains or snows tomorrow, we won't go to Topsham 
or play cricket. I'll give you a moment to try and symbolize this complex proposition. When writing this proposition in symbol form, we see it comes to look like this. PVQ arrow tilde SVR. Now, this is a very complex proposition. There are four simple propositions within it. It rains tomorrow, it snows tomorrow. We go to Topsham, we play cricket. Those four propositions all need to be connected because this is one sentence, one complex proposition. We notice that it's an if-then statement, but also that there's or claims, and also we've negated something with the word no, won't. When we're writing this, it's important that we get the parentheses in the right place, just like with a math problem. We see on the second half of this proposition, the consequent portion, the negation comes before the parentheses, because what we're saying is that going or going to Topsham and playing cricket both won't happen if it rains or snows. So here we see that going to Topsham and playing cricket is a necessary condition upon the weather. basically saying, if the weather is bad, we will not get to play or go. Let's try another. If I don't drink both wine and spirits tonight, I won't get the desired effect. I'll give you a minute to try this one on your own. This can be broken down into three simple propositions and is then symbolized as follows. The simple propositions, I drink wine tonight, I drink spirits tonight, I get the desired effect. Each one of these simple propositions has a truth value of its own. But when combined, the complex proposition will have a truth value of its own. Here we're using a conjunction and also a conditional statement. Notice how the conditional statement is the main operator of this proposition. This means that drinking wine and spirits needs to be grouped together as the antecedent, meaning that not drinking wine and spirits is sufficient for not getting the desired effect. Not getting the desired effect is necessary upon not drinking wine and spirits. It's important that we think about these conditional statements in terms of the necessary and sufficient condition. Remember, propositions may not necessarily use the words if then, and it still could be a conditional statement. Here's another. The Chargers will win the Super Bowl if they get rid of Phillip Rivers. Two simple propositions. The Chargers will win the Super Bowl. Phillip Rivers leaves the Chargers. And here we see Q arrow P. Notice how it's the second portion, if they get rid of Philip Rivers, which is the antecedent of the, of the proposition. 
meaning that it comes before and is sufficient for the necessary consequent of the Chargers winning the Super Bowl. How about this one? Either the Democrats win the next election or I'm going to leave the country. Again, we have two simple propositions. The Democrats win the next election. I leave the country, both having their own truth value. And when put together, look like this. Now, the reason that we have the biconditional sign with the negation is because when I'm using the either or in an exclusive manner, then it's important that I use a biconditional rather than a simple disjunctive or. A disjunctive or represents an and or statement, not an either or statement. Either or statements are a little tricky in that I'm not saying that either the Democrats win the election or I leave the country in a way where both can be true. Instead, I'm saying that if one happens, I'm negating the other. And if the other happens, I'm negating the first. So here, if the Democrats win, I will leave the country. And if I leave the country, it means the Democrats must have lost. It can also be written this way. All we're saying with this negation by conditional is that when one happens, the other has to happen. And the reason we negate it is because we can't have both at the same time. So we're saying it's one or the other, but not both. Typically, when we use a disjunctive or claim, the V symbol, we're saying or, or possibly and. We're using an and or claim. So I can have fish or chicken to, for dinner tonight. Perhaps I have both. That's perfectly acceptable. But here, it's saying I can have either fish or chicken. I can't have both. And my accepting one denies the other. So P or Q, where the or is exclusive, should be symbolized with the biconditional and negation. So it's up to you when looking at arguments to determine is the argument exclusive or not? Because sometimes we'll use either or, but it's not exclusive. And sometimes we use either or and it is. It just depends on whether or not the writer or speaker is speaking or writing in a way where one is exclusive of the other. So now that we've symbolized propositions, we can do the same for an entire argument. The argument here is if it's lunch, then the gong will have sounded. The gong hasn't sounded, therefore it's not lunch. Each one of these propositions, the two premises and the conclusion, will be symbolized using a set of letters and symbols to represent the simple propositions. Here we see that this argument has two simple propositions, 
it's lunch, and the gong has sounded. Notice how these two simple propositions are used throughout the entire argument. And then we combine these to create the symbolic standard form argument that looks like this. P arrow Q, not Q, not P. We're saying if it's lunch, P, then arrow, the gong will have sounded. Then in premise two, we're saying the gong has not sounded. It's not the case that the gong has sounded. And then in conclusion three, we say it's not the case that it's lunch. It is not lunch. From this symbol form, we can better see how the premises work to guarantee the conclusion. And if we can't, then we'll need to create a truth table which will tell us definitely whether or not the argument's valid or invalid. This argument happens to be valid. How about this argument? We've seen this argument before. If there is no resurrection of the dead, then Christ did not rise. If Christ did not rise, then our preaching in your faith is in vain. Our preaching in your faith is not in vain. Therefore, Christ did rise. There is a resurrection of the dead. First thing you need to do is determine how many simple propositions there are and represent each simple proposition with a letter. There are four in this argument. There is a resurrection of the dead, Christ rose, our preaching is in vain, your faith is in vain. These are as simple as you can make the propositions. Each one of these has its own truth value. But when combined, you will get a different truth value. So when we combine these using symbols, we get a standard form argument that looks like this. It's not the case that P, arrow, not the case that Q, meaning if there is no resurrection of the dead P, then it's not the case that Christ rose. And if it's not the case that Christ rose, then our preaching R and your faith S is in vain. And it's not the case that your preaching R and your faith S is in vain. Therefore, Christ rose Q and there is a resurrection of the dead P. Again, here we have a valid argument. But to see that, it will be helpful to create a truth table. And we'll do that later. And so when we're using propositional logic, these complex propositions are known as truth functions of the simple propositions contained within them. Again, when we're looking at something simple like a conjunctive claim, P and Q, the truth of P and Q is a function of both the truth of P and the truth of Q. So the truth function depends on the truth of P and the truth of Q and nothing else. So if we know that P is true and we know that Q is true, we know deductively that P and Q is true. And so this truth functional character can be brought out using truth tables, which is why creating truth tables will help us to determine an argument's validity. Truth tables show how complex propositions depend on the truth of the simple propositions within it.
And so when we're creating a truth table, it's important that we construct reference columns for each of the simple propositions. These reference columns tell you of a different possible truth value, a different possible world in which the simple propositions are true or false. Think of a reference column as dividing the world into possible states of affairs. Ones in which the propositions are true, ones in which the propositions are false. So take, for instance, this simple proposition, Alex is sick. Because it's a simple proposition, there are two possible states of affairs that could exist. It's either true that Alex is sick or false that Alex is sick. The proposition Alex is sick is represented by the skull and crossbones. So the column up and down represents the simple proposition, Alex is sick. The row sideways represents the state of affairs of whether or not that proposition is true or false. Here we have two states of affairs. When we have two simple propositions, the states of affairs doubles because now there are twice as many possibilities that come from these two simple propositions. So there's a state of affairs in which Alex is sick and happy. There is a state of affairs in which Alex is sick and not happy. There's a state of affairs when Alex is not sick and is happy, and a state of affairs when Alex is not sick and not happy. These are the reference columns, and these will typically always be the same. In that, for each column, for each reference column up and down, you will have the first column with T's and F's. So if there are four rows in column one, the skull and crossbones column, then the top two rows will be true, the bottom two will be false. In column two, the smiley face column, we will then have the first column if there's two and two in the first column, then I want one, 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 one in the second column. This is just to make sure that each state of affairs is represented. We're creating all possible worlds with the rows. Once we draw up the reference columns, we can then draw in a third column representing the truth condition of the complex proposition. So we can draw in the truth condition when a certain operator is being used. And this tells you for each possible combination of truth values represented, whether the complex proposition is true or false. So in this third column, the skull and crossbones and percent smiley face, this is the complex proposition of the conjunctive claim that Alex is sick and Alex is happy. So when Alex is sick and Alex is happy, look into the third column, the column in black, and notice how the truth function is true. In rows three, in rows two, three, and four, however, we see that the truth function in these states of affairs 
is all false. Because if I tell you, if I'm looking at row 2, TFF, that it's true that Alex is sick, but it's false that Alex is happy. And so if it's true that I'm sick and false that I'm happy, looking back up at the very top right corner, Alex is sick and happy. Is it true that Alex is sick and happy if it's false that I'm happy? And no, it's not true. Because in order for a conjunctive claim to be true, both parts of the conjunction need to be true. If any one of the parts of a conjunction is false, then the entire complex truth function is false. Similarly, in row three, we see that Alex, it's false that I'm Alex is sick, but it's true that Alex is happy. So if we were to ask, is Alex sick and happy? The answer would be false because in row three, we have an F that represents my being sick or Alex being sick. Similarly, in row four, the last row, we see FFF. If it's false that I'm sick and false that I'm happy, it must be false that I'm sick and happy. So here we're just seeing how the reference columns can get us to the truth function of the complex proposition. Let's look at this. P represents the phone is on the table. There is a state of affairs in which the phone is on the table and a state of affairs in which the phone is not on the table, represented by the red T and F. Now, when I look at the complex proposition of the phone is not on the table, meaning that I have to use the tilde negation, I need to ask myself, when the phone is on the table, when we're looking at the red T, but then I'm asking you, or I'm saying that the phone is not on the table. I am making a false claim because we know by the column in red in row one that the phone is on the table. So that if I say the phone's not on the table, I'm saying something that's false. If we look at row two, where the red F is located, this means that the phone is not on the table, right? It's false that the phone is on the table. Therefore, if I say the phone is not on the table, I must be saying something. This is the truth function of a negation. Looking back at a conjunctive statement, phone is on the table and the pen is on the table, or the phone and the pen are on the table. When both are on the table, we see in row one, T and T, we would get a true in the truth function column in row one. Because if I tell you the phone and pen are on the table, and the state of affairs that we're living in, they both are on the table, then I'm saying something that's true. In the next row, if I'm saying that this state of affairs, this possible world that we're living in, the phone is on the table, but the pen's not on the table, then my claim that the phone and the pen are on the table is false. If the if we're living in a world where the state of affairs is that the phone, it's false that the phone is on the table, but the pen is on the table in row three. My claim that the phone and the pen are on the table is false again. And if both are false,
you can see for a conjunctive statement, the only time a conjunction statement is true is when both parts are true together. We do this all the time, and we already know that this is the case. If I were to tell you that the Patriots and the Rams are going to be in the Super Bowl again this year, then the only time that what I'm saying is true is if both the Patriots and the Rams are in the Super Bowl. If any one of them is not in the Super Bowl or neither is in the Super Bowl, then I will have been wrong and said something that is false. When we use a disjunctive or claim, the phone or the pen is on the table. In this instance, in row one, you have a state of affairs in which the pen is on, it's true that the pen is on the table and it's true that the phone is on the table. The truth function is true. In row two, if the phone is on the table but the pen is not on the table, and I tell you the phone or the pen is on the table, that's also true because all you need is one. Same thing for row three. The phone is not on the table, but the pen is on the table. If I'm telling you the phone or the pen is on the table, then I'm safe with just one being there. The only time in which the truth function of a disjunctive statement is false is when both states of affairs are false. If I told you the phone or the pen is on the table, but neither was on the table, then I would have said something false. For a conditional statement. Here I'm saying if the phone is on the table, then the pen is on the table. If the state of affairs in row one is true of both, then the conditional statement as a truth functional statement is true. Now in row two, I see that the phone is on the table but the pen is not on the table. So if I tell you if the phone is on the table, then the pen is on the table, and the pen is not on the table, then I will have just lied and made a false statement. In row three, I'm saying if the phone is on the table, then the pen is on the table. Here, we actually see that the truth function is true when the antecedent, the part coming before the arrow, is false. Because when we use if-then claims, we're speaking hypothetically about a state of affairs. And if the antecedent, the first part, is not true, we do not need the second part. So if I say, if the phone is on the table, then the pen is on the table, but the phone's not on the table, then the pen doesn't have to be on the table. Now this means that the truth function is true because technically I will not have lied or said something false. Call, uh, row three and row four are often confusing, but will make more sense when you think about whether or not a lie or the truth is being told. So I'm telling you, if the phone is on the table, then the pen has to be on the table. But then I don't put the phone on the table. Technically, I haven't lied to you or told you anything that's false. The only time that I will have said something false is if the phone is on the table, but the pen is missing from the table. Then I have said something false. So when we use conditional statements, if the antecedent is false, the truth function is always going to be true. For a biconditional, the phone is on the table if and only if the pen is on the table. Here we see that both 
or because both are necessary and sufficient of one another, both have to appear together or not at all. So in row one, we see that both are true. So the truth function of this complex proposition is true. In rows two and three, one is true while the other is false. But remember, with a biconditional, they're both necessary and sufficient of one another, which means they both need to appear together, or not at all. So in rows 2 and 3, the truth function of the proposition is false. In row 4, because both are false, the truth function is true. Because remember, P and Q have to appear together. If P is there, then Q has to be there. If P is not there, then Q cannot be there. So if I tell you the phone is on the table if and only if the pen is on the table, it's true when both or neither is on the table. It is false when one or the other is on the table. So now we can use truth tables to define the meaning of these propositional operators. The next few slides are just repeat tables that you need to commit to memory. The negation, the conjunction. Remember, a conjunction is only true when both parts are true. It is false in all other states of affairs. A disjunction, PVQ. A disjunction is only false when both are false, because we're talking about one or the other. So it can be true as long as one or both are there. Biconditional, where both need to appear together. The truth function of the complex proposition, if and only if, is true when both are true or both are false, but false when one or the other is true and false. And lastly, the conditional. And a conditional statement is only false when the antecedent is true and the consequent is false. Because if I tell you, if I use an if-then statement and the antecedent if is true, but the consequent Q is false, then that complex proposition is false. And so it's important moving forward that when we look at conditional statements, we're, a conditional logic is not a causal but material conditional. Right? So we're not necessarily saying that P causes Q. We're just saying that the material existence of P is sufficient for the material existence of Q. This means that the statement, if P then Q is true whenever both P and Q are true, regardless of whether P has caused Q or not. And that if P then Q is true whenever P is false, again, regardless of whether P might have caused Q. So take this phrase, for instance, if Mesa is the best university in the world, then I'm the Pope. The implication is I'm not the Pope, therefore Mesa is not the best university in the world. In other words, the conjunction remains true, even though it's clearly not the case that Mesa being the best university in the world would transform me into the Pope somehow. We're just saying the material existence of one is sufficient for the material existence of the other. So when we're drawing out our truth tables, it's important that we get first the reference columns in place. If we're looking at this argument, or if we're looking at this proposition, if John is not sick, then John is happy. We see that it's a complex proposition written in the form of tilde, skull and crossbones, arrow, smiley face, right? 
when we draw up the reference columns, we see that because we're using two simple propositions, there are four rows. If we used three simple propositions, there would be eight rows. If we used four simple propositions, there would be 16 rows. And you keep doubling the rows with every simple proposition because you are doubling the states of affairs that could exist. So here, there are four states of affairs to combine these two simple propositions. In order to draw a column for this complex proposition, I need to break it down into each operator. So before doing tilde, skull, and crossbones, arrow, smiley face, I need to draw a column for the negation, skull, and crossbones. So the negation, skull, and crossbones, if you remember the tilde template, the negation template, a negation is just the opposite of what the reference is. So if my reference column says TTFF, then my negation of that will be FFTT. I'm only looking at the skull and crossbones reference column. I have no interest in the smiley face right now. But now, once I have the negation skull and crossbones, I can then rewrite my smiley face column and then look at the template for the conditional statement. Now, looking up at this template, I see that the pattern of when P is true and Q is false is the only time in which my conditional is false. And so I will look for the pattern of T and F in my antecedent and consequent column on the truth table and see that the fourth row is the only TF row. And so if row four is TF, then the truth function of the complex proposition, tilde, skull, and crossbones, arrow, smiley face, will be F, but in all other instances, it will be true. So I'm simply just looking at the reference column and matching the pattern in my truth table. If I see, for instance, in row three, TT, then I'll look up at my reference column, or I'll look up at my, at my template here in the top right, and see when TT appears in PQ, then I know that the complex truth function is T. I can look at FF in my template and see when I get FF, the truth function is T. So I go into my truth table and see that in row three, I see TT, so it must be T. I see in row three, or I'm sorry, I see in row two that it's FF, that must be true, and so forth. Now this is just one proposition and you will continually add columns for each other proposition within an argument. Let's try it again. Here we have just one proposition, but this one proposition has many operators and we see based on the smiley face, the computer screen, and the skull and crossbones, that there are three simple propositions within this complex proposition. John is unhappy if and only if John is working and John is sick. We see that John is happy is a simple proposition. John is working is a simple proposition. And John is sick is a proposition. We draw out our reference columns, and your reference columns always look the same all the time. Nothing ever changes. Because there are three reference columns, that means you will have eight rows because there are eight possible combinations that you can make using three items. The far left column, you will have with true and falses, meaning that the first four will be true, the second four will be false, 
in column two, we just see that half of four is two, so we'll alternate two, 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 all the way down. And then half of two is one, so in column three, we will alternate all the way down. True, false, true, false, true, false, true, false. This is just so that we can make sure that we're touching all our bases for each set of affairs that could exist in the world. Now we see that in order to continue this truth table for this complex proposition, we need to make a column for each sub symbol within the complex proposition. So for instance, negation smiley face. I create a column for negation smiley face, and this is just the opposite of the smiley face column. If the smiley face column is true, 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 false, 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 then the negation is false, 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 true, 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 true. Now, before doing the biconditional arrow, I see that the computer screen and the skull and crossbones are in parentheses, meaning that they need to be done separately. And so I will draw a column for computer screen and skull and crossbones. Here, I'm looking at my reference column at just column two and column three, the column with the computer screen and the column with the skull and crossbones. And then I'm using my template of the conditional, uh, I'm sorry, using the template of the conjunction and. And I'll notice when I use the template for the conjunction and, the only time an and claim is ever true is when both parts are true. So we see in row one where the computer screen is true and the skull and crossbones is true, the complex proposition of computer screen and skull and crossbones is true. In rows two, three, and four, there's a false, so we know the complex proposition has to be false. We see in row five that both are true again, and so the complex proposition is true. And then in row six, seven, and eight, there is a false, so the complex proposition is false. Now that we've done the computer screen and the skull and crossbones, we can look at the column for the negation smiley face and the column for the skull and crossbones and the computer screen and make a new column with the entire complex proposition. That entire complex proposition includes the biconditional, so we'll use the biconditional key and focus our attention on just those two columns, the negation smiley face and the computer screen and scroll and crossbones. And remember, when we're looking at the key for a biconditional, we see that a biconditional is true when both parts are true. So in row one, both are not the same, so it's false. In row two, both are the same, so it's true. In row three, both are the same, so it's true. In row four, both are the same, so it's true. In row five, both are the same, so it's true. In row six, seven, and eight, they are different, so those are false. Here is the truth table for this complex proposition. And for every complex proposition, you will break down the truth table into the simpler propositions in order to create the complex proposition. Now again, remember, this is just one proposition. For every proposition you have in an argument, for each premise and the conclusion, you will have to create new columns. So when creating a truth table, you first have to draw up reference columns for the simple propositions, and then construct a truth table construct columns for the premises. Also, you'll have to construct a column for the conclusion. And if either premises or conclusion are complex, you will have to break them down into their necessary reference columns. So let's look at this argument. Here you see that the two uh, propositions in black are the premises and the proposition in red is a conclusion. 
it doesn't necessarily matter what these symbols represent. We can still determine whether or not the argument is valid regardless of the, the content behind these symbols. This is why drawing truth tables is often very helpful because we see how the premises relate to the conclusion and we don't get caught up in all of the content. So here we draw our reference columns. You'll notice because we're only using two symbols, a skull and crossbones and a smiley face, that there's only two simple propositions, meaning four rows. The reference column is all the states of affairs of these uh, two combined simple uh, propositions. Now, using the first, going through the first premise, we see a negation skull and crossbones before the arrow. So we need to do a negation skull and crossbones first. The negation skull and crossbones is just the opposite of the skull and crossbones reference column. So if the reference column skull and crossbones is two, true, true, false, false, the negation of that is false, false, true, true. And now we can draw the negation skull and crossbones with the smiley face and get the first premise, which is true, 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 false. Here you'll notice that I've just rewritten the smiley face column. And the reason I've rewritten the smiley face column is because the skull and crossbone negation is the antecedent to the conditional statement. My antecedent is what's on the left side of the arrow, the smiley face, the consequent is on the right side of the arrow. So I will want to represent that in my truth table. Now you don't have to do it this way, but you will have to remember that the negation skull and crossbones is the antecedent. So when you look at the key and you see that P arrow Q, it's the P that is the antecedent regardless of that arrow. I find it helpful to just rewrite the smiley face because the smiley face is the consequent and I want the consequent to the right of my antecedent because that's the way the arrow points. And now I can look at negation skull and crossbones and see when negation skull and crossbones is true and smiley face is false, then my complex proposition is false. In all other states of affairs, it's true, which is why in row four, I see that premise one is false, but in rows one, two, and three, premise one is true. Next, I will create a column for the next premise, which is negation, skull, uh, negation smiley face. I simply look back to the initial reference column of the smiley face and I do the opposite. If smiley face is true, false, true, false, I will write false, true, false, true. And then I will rewrite my column for my conclusion, which is just, I will repeat skull and crossbones, true, true, false, false. So here I have my two premises in blue and my conclusion in green. When we're determining validity, we are only looking at the premise columns and the conclusion column. And we're looking for a very specific pattern where the premises are true and the conclusion is false. So if in blue, I have a row that is true, true, and the green that's false, then I know my argument's going to be invalid. If I don't find a true, true, false row, then my argument is valid. This is because a valid argument is one in which the premises, if the premises are true, the conclusion must be true also. Therefore, if the truth table depicts a situation in which all of the premises are true, but the conclusion is false, then clearly the conclusion does not follow from the premises.
It's important to note that if we see a row with all trues, this does not tell us anything. What we need to look for is true premises and a false conclusion, because we're trying to determine whether or not the conclusion follows from the premises. So if there are any rows where the premises are true and the conclusion is false, the entire argument is invalid. If there are no such rows, the argument is valid. Looking back at the argument we just did, we see that there are no rows where you have true premises and a false conclusion. Now in row two, you have true premises and a true conclusion, but that doesn't tell us anything about whether or not the conclusion follows from the premises. It just may be the case that you're using uh, all true propositions, but that doesn't mean they're connected in any way. So we want to look for true premises, false conclusion. True premises and a true conclusion tell us nothing. Let's try another. John is sick and flying, then John is not happy. John is sick, John is not flying, John is happy. Now, remember, this is the second portion, or the second part of analyzing an argument. Remember, arguments don't come in bullet point form like this. They'll come in paragraph form. So essentially, what you will need to do to determine the validity of an argument is take it from paragraph form and turn it into the standard form that you see in front of you. You will then need to identify each simple proposition and represent that simple proposition with a letter or picture. You will need to connect all complex propositions with simple symbols, operators, and then put that into a truth table to determine whether or not the argument is valid or invalid. So here, if John is sick and flying, then John is not happy. John is sick, John is not flying, therefore John is happy. We see that there are three simple propositions being used. John is sick, John is flying, John is happy. Now, when we combined these simple propositions to make the complex propositions, we get something like this. If P and Q together, then not R. P by itself, not Q by itself, therefore R. So if John is sick P and flying Q, then John is not happy R. John is sick P, John is not flying Q, therefore John is happy R. So now taking this symbol formed argument, we can draw up our reference columns. We see here that there are three simple propositions, which means there will be eight rows to our truth table, each accounting for a state of affairs, and then we see that we need to break each one of these down. P and Q first. Remember when P and Q are both true, then the complex proposition of P and Q are true. So our first column, we see that rows one and two are true and all the rest are false. Now before we make a column for the arrow, we need to make sure that we're making a column for not R. Not R is just the opposite of R. And now we can see P and Q as the antecedent to a conditional statement and not R as a consequent to an, a conditional statement. So we look at the conditional key template and see that when the antecedent is true and the consequent is false, then the complex proposition is false. All other situations are true. So we can see in row one, the antecedent is true and the consequent is false. And in all other rows, we do not have that true-false combination. So in the first row, the complex proposition is going to be false. In the rest of P1, it's true. And then P2 and P3 are just a restatement of P. And P3 is the negation of Q. And the conclusion is just a restatement of R.
So here we have premise one, premise two, premise three in blue and the conclusion in green. This is the entirety of the truth table. So from here, we need to see if there are any rows in which P1, P2, and P3 are true, and the conclusion is false. In row one, uh, we see there are falses. In row two, we see that there are falses uh, in P3. In row three, you see true, 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 but the conclusion is true, so that doesn't tell us anything. In row four, you see the premises are true and the conclusion is false. This is what we're looking for to determine whether or not an argument is valid or invalid. If I find a row where the premises are true and the conclusion is false, then I'm done. I can stop my work there. I know that my argument is invalid. Therefore, regardless what anything else says in row four, I see the pattern of true premises and a false conclusion, so I know my argument is invalid. The premises do not guarantee my conclusion. One helpful tip and a rule known as De Morgan's Law is essentially that the negation of a conjunction is the disjunction of the negations. So when you see a complex proposition in parentheses, it may be easier for you to rewrite the conjunction as a disjunction with the negations. Similarly, the negation of a disjunction is a conjunction with negations. So we see that uh, when we have a disjunction in parentheses, we can probably easy, more easily write it with the negation of and conjunction. Uh, sorry, negation and yeah, conjunction. So this is just helpful uh, when it comes to analyzing uh, complex propositions and writing those complex propositions into truth tables. So rather than having to deal with the parentheses, I can simply just uh, shoot the negation sign into the parentheses, into both the P and the Q, and flip the symbol from conjunction to disjunction or disjunction to conjunction.